We're sure I'm really glad to be able to do this. Uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity. And I'm really grateful for the folks that have come here, uh, for Kenneth and, and Kelly, and uh, for what they're doing. I, I think it's sad when somebody goes above and beyond you know, she could take her check and go home and, hey, no problem. But she's trying to, they, they are concerned about the community. They want to do something to help. And that needs to be recognized. That's important. There's not many people do that anymore. I'm going to take care of me and I don't much care about my neighbor. But that's what we're doing. Um, so, kudos. Uh, a little bit of... I guess introduction. Uh, I came into this world in a little town south of Spokane by the name of Fairfield out in the country. I've lived on the farm all my life, farmed for 60 years. It's been good to me. I've been some hard years. 1980, the farming community went through as bad a depression as the Great Depression in 1929. It wiped out a third of the farmers in the base. In fact, I think more than that. They had an auction sale every day of the week except Saturday and Sunday. Some days they had two auctions. They didn't want to have those auctions, but the bank says, you are going to have an auction, and they had an auction. So we survived all that. Um, but we came on to this. I did have some college. Um, I was pretty young. I'm only 17. It's probably the biggest problem, but the things they were teaching me, Dad lived through the Depression. I, I lived through half of it. But he learned how to farm and, and survive and even prosper during the Depression. And the things that they were trying to teach me didn't match up. He was successful, very successful farmer. Worked hard, taught us ethics, taught us the value of hard work, value of saving money, value of staying out of debt, get out of debt, stay there. And you can't put a price on that. That's, uh, that's very important. So that's where I started, uh, about a 500 acre dry land farm. I eventually took it over and farmed it myself. And then my first wife came down to multiple sclerosis and we decided for stress, I turned it over to my brother and uh, got a job in town for a few years, but it was still in the farming community. It was a machinery dealer. And uh, then anyway, I moved to the Columbia Basin then, I believe, in 78. And we farmed there for 30 years, I believe. We bought a farm, and this program that we're presenting here basically paid for that farm. I never had a job off the farm. My wife was not able to work. What we raised on that farm paid for the farm. 300 acre farm, million dollar place. Paid for by the farm. It works, folks. It works. I'm here to tell you. We want to do that. Um, as I understand, Lewis County is one of the lowest income per capita in the state of Washington. I think we can change that. And this is a big step. And I think there's going to be some other folks come along. We'll see this. And, you know, we're changing every single day. We've seen more change in the last year than what we've seen in 30, 40 years, probably. So we're used to change. Some change is really good. This change is good. I see no negative parts to it. We've gone through the whole thing. It basically started in New Zealand. That's where it started. And in New Zealand, that depression in the 80s that hit, the country of New Zealand is very small and the farmers got in big trouble. They don't have an industrial base to support the farmers like we do. So they get together and said, well, fellas, what are we gonna do? So they said, well, what do we got? They said, we got good land, we got a good climate. Okay. So they developed the rotational grazing program. They do a lot of dairying there. The average dairyman retires at 50 years of age. 
in New Zealand, but they have a pr apprentice program. They'll bring along young people in their farm and then they will teach them. And when they think that they are capable, and I mean, you gotta be good. It's a washout deal. If you're good enough, you get the farm, you get to take over the farm. And it's a wonderful program and it's working. Um, but they learn how to do this to start it out with, and the names put on this uh, represent the change. It has started out rotational grazing, and then it changed to intensive grazing. And so they married the two, and now they call it intensive rotational grazing, or managed, managed rotational grazing or maybe for sure, I'd rather not name it after a Russian airplane, but anyway, that's, that's where, and maybe it's developed now to a point that there's a different name, I don't know. So, um, that's the program. I raised alfalfa, hay in the basin, and the cattle, and that's what paid off the mortgage. The last few years I was there, I had no debt on anything, machinery, car, nothing. I accumulated enough cash that I could buy cattle on my own. When I went to the auction sale, I spent my money to buy that cattle. I didn't have to go to the banker. That gave me a tremendous advantage. I ran a stocker program. We'd buy 400 pound, three to 400 pound calves, keep me in the corral until they were used to the area and they would come to me and then we put them out on pasture and they never left the pasture until we we take them up to 800 pounds. Usually took about eight months and when they were ready to go to the feedlot, and the feedlots want 800 pounds. That's what they want. We took them to 800 pounds. I called the feedlot, said I got to send my load of cattle. We'd agree on a price. They knew my cattle. They were tame. They had all their shots. They would go into their feedlots walk right in, they were used to a feed bump, they give them a booster shot and that's it. They were gaining the next day. Worked for them, worked for me. Worked really well. But if you are, uh, you know, change starts with thinking. And what, I, I like several, there are several terms, words that we use. Uh, business model, I like that. Whether you've got one calf for your own meat, or I don't know that people have cows for their own milk, I, they do, they want to know. Whether you have one or you have 500 dairy, you have a business. Think of it in terms of the model, business model that you want. And in, you're producing a commodity. But really what you're producing is forage. That's your goal. You want to produce as much forage as your land and your management is capable of doing and then market that forage, high quality forage, through animals. If you're in a dairy, great. Works good. I got a good friend of mine doing this in Sunnyside. Haven't talked to him for several years. Last time I talked to him, he'd buy another farm every couple of years. I imagine he wrote a check for it. Um, but he would probably be available. And there are several ways. I think goats that were good in this area, except for the cougars and eagles and bobcats and all of goats and sheep. And that's something you'd have to overcome. Some areas that probably wouldn't work. Um, but that's what you're doing. You're, you're producing high quality forage. And then you're marketing through the enterprise that you choose. You may have to change your enterprise. You may find something that works better than what you're doing. But in order to maximize your profit, and we want you to be profitable, that's, but I don't want you to think about profit just money only. We want you to prosper. Prospering your health, prospering your family relations prosper in your standing in the community. And that's all part of what they're doing. And that's why I want to do what I can. I've got a lot of experience, made a lot of mistakes. Boy, some of this stuff was very costly, but I learned. 
So this is where we are. Um, I don't know just where there's a number of pictures that you have or uh, kind of has and you can work this in. So I, I'd like to show you something. I think we'll move outside. And I'd like to show you uh, the results of a rotational grazing program. Uh, I am doing it here. Uh, but it, it works it works very well. Uh, as I said, I started out in Spokane County as dry land country. I raised cattle there. I moved to the Columbia Basin. That's an excellent area for cattle. Very dry. And there's an awful lot of feeds, vegetable processing that they can use for animal feed, which they get it for hauling. Uh, a lot of cattle there is a good market. They've got a lot of things going. But this area also, that's what you need, what we need to do. What can we do better here in this area than they can? You can do it better. You've got a milder climate here than the basin. It gets cold over there. And when it gets down around 15 degrees and stays there for a month on end, all the feed you're putting into those cattle, all it's doing is keeping them alive. They're not gaining. If you're producing milk, they'll drop in their milk production. And it takes a whole lot more feed to do it. You've got a nice mild climate here. That's a big, big plus. You've got an excellent soil, organic matter, 5 to 7%. That's money in the bank. Think of organic matter as dollars in the bank, because that's what they are. And you can benefit from that. Uh, that's all here. So you have, if you have that source, you have land that you can use, whether you own it or own it or rent it, doesn't matter. If you, if you have control of that land, there is, I sincerely believe, a real opportunity in this area. A uh, tremendous opportunity. So we'll go on now. We'll, we'll, we'll look at grassroots. Hopefully we piqued your interest here, and maybe there's something to this. Well, we'll find out. This, now there's another term I want you to get familiar with, rotational versus stock set. Stock set, you put your cattle out when the grass starts to grow, you leave them there all summer till fall, take them back in the barn in the winter, that's stock set rotational, you rotate the grass, rotate the animals through the field. Um, ideally, you don't never, ever, 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 don't graze below three inches. With most men, that's the uh, first knuckle, middle finger. If it's lower than that, get your cattle out of there. Quick, yesterday. Um, so, and stock set, what happens? You, you, you've seen it, but maybe it didn't register, you didn't know. You watch a grazing animal. They're going to walk along, their nose right at the ground level, and they'll bite here, and they go bite over there. They don't sit here most of the time unless it's real good forage. What they're doing is they can smell the sugar in the carbohydrates. The carbohydrates is where the feed value is. Higher the carbohydrates, the higher the feed value. That's what you want. But you've got to build a scenario whereas that plant can rebuild and restore itself to a high level of carbohydrates. <clears throat> now, ideally, we're going to take this plant, we're going to use it from four inches up to 12 inches. That's where we want to use it. How are we going to do that? Well, we can get, we we'll see the machinery dealer. I used to be one. And he'll sell you a bunch of machinery. You go out there and cut that, and then you can take it off, and you can take it and feed it to your cows. There's another way to do it. That's what we're talking about. That's rotational grazing. You can with the technology that the industry has available for you. Uh, polywire for, uh, that's a, looks like baling wire. It's got little sh shrouds or strands of stainless steel wire and a spool, you can wind it up. You can set up 
oh man, uh, when I could still walk, uh, I could do, I could change ca uh, cattle every, about every 20 minutes, 150 head. In 20 minutes, I could move them a foot, or eight feet. It's about what they were eating every day, about eight feet. But you're harvesting that center section by moving your animals. And they're self-propelled, four-wheel drive. Can't beat that. Uh, they feed themselves. They've got a apparatus self-feeding. That's a good deal. And then when they're done, they spread the waste. And it didn't cost you anything. And we actually went out on our farm in Othello, and I had two extension fellows helping me, and we got these little flags, and we went all over. Every time a cow patty, we'd mark it. And another, we mark it. Here's all these red flags. I imagine that was a little different for people to look at. But what we wanted to know is how close do they spread the manure to replace the plant plant? A grazing animal returns between 80 and 90 percent of the nutrients through to the soil. Then they add bacteria and enzymes that go into the soil. They add a little. So they pretty much keep everything in place as if you'd work that in under as a green manure crop. Okay, so this is done this morning about 8 o'clock. Uh, this is a field that was stock set as long as we've been here. Uh, no fertilizer, uh, no amendments to the soil, and I imagine this is native grass. I want, want you to see what happens. We take a plug on the ground. Okay. Are you looking at roots now? Okay. What we want is white roots. The brown ones are already dead. They're going to turn into organic matter and they're going to feed the soil. A uh, little weed gum in here. Um, here's a little tiny white one here. They're pretty few and far between. Okay, you can see how much growth there is. This is the 22nd day of April. Okay. Same farm, different manuscript. What we want is white roots. White roots are money in the bank. That's your future growth. Brown roots, great, but they're not going to do you much good right now. They're going to turn into organic now. And the roots precede. The roots grow about two weeks ahead of the plant. Okay, do you see some white roots? Hot dog! <laughs> <laughs> Look what we got already. He's just about ready to graze. Just about. Mostly white roots. Good, healthy plant. And a lot of brown ones it's going to build for the future. Um, systems and cycles. Now, don't let me scare you away. You are used to working with systems and cycles. Uh, the weather is a system. You probably don't plant grass in January, and maybe you do. I guess it'd be all right if you want to, but usually you plant the grass when it's going to grow. You don't harvest hay in November or December. You're working with the weather system, and there's great benefits. There are four cycles in a perennial forage system. We're only going to deal with one today. And that's the one that you really need to know about. Every day, every 24 hours, the 
carbohydrates in that plant. Okay, where are we going to start? Uh, let's start at daylight. To me, it's a circle. That's what I've got in my mind. The carbohydrates at daylight are mostly in the roots. When the sun comes up, starts to warm up, those carbohydrates migrate up into the plant. You should really never cut your hay before nine o'clock. All you're gonna get is a bunch of, um, well, you get lots of straw and stuff, but your, your carbohydrate level by nine o'clock is gonna be good. There are several universities and others that run tests. They have taken hay that was cut seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, all during the day. At nine to 10 o'clock, it's a good feed. And they'll take uh, hay bale, take wafers, and they'll scatter these. When was it cut? As I said, the animal can smell sugar. They'll walk up to that feed bunk, they'll take, they'll get over here and they'll start eating the stuff that's cut after nine o'clock. Quit cutting at eight, because then it starts back into the roots. So, making hay or silage, don't cut before nine, be done by eight. That's long enough day. You don't need more than that. So, um, you can evaluate what you got. I strongly recommend soil testing. Uh, it is, a soil test is a, a road map. Okay, let's say you decide you're gonna to go to Atlanta, Georgia. And so, well, you get your car all packed full of gas. Okay, how do you get to Atlanta, Georgia? Well, it's east. Okay, we're gonna keep driving until we get there. You probably make it if you don't end up in the ocean, but you know, you're gonna to have to get instruction along the way and different things. Or you can get a map and that tells you where you are. You start from where you are and read the map to your route to where you want to be. A lot less effort, a lot less expensive, and it works very well. Uh, you can get a soil testing kit, do it yourself for 20, $22, I think, at your hardware store. Last time I checked, very simple to do. And that is invaluable. You can monitor your progress with soil testing. And you can evaluate, we'll maybe touch that later if this continues on, uh, just by looking at the plants. They turn color if they're short, different nutrients. I won't go into that. Most of you know nitrogen is, is green, real dark green. That's a good, this is pretty good, pretty good color. So uh, I think that'll probably handle it for that. I don't want to overload you. Um, if you've got some questions, I sure hope you do. Uh, ask Hannah. <laughs> and if Hannah doesn't know, she'll ask, she'll ask her, her buddies in, in this. But again, uh, thanks for your time, folks. Uh, we want to make this a, a, a more, a better, more prosperous place. Uh, and I think we get some folks on board and we're going to be doing it.